Okay, everybody, uh, welcome back. I'm going to introduce Jake, and he's going to show us in about 30 minutes a new uh, extension he's developed for ArcGIS. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Jake Wall. I'm a PhD, trying to finish my PhD at uh, University of British Columbia. And my primary topic is on the movement ecology of elephants. So I've been studying elephants uh, with Ian Douglas Hamilton and George Wittemeyer for um, about six, seven years now. So this project, ArcMet, has just kind of been a side project. Um, I don't quite know how I got started <laughs> programming for um, ArcGIS, but that's just how it turned out. And um, that's how I've been running my analyses. Um, so I've decided to package what I've built so far and uh, make that as a tool that other people can use as well. So it's, a, it's an extension for ArcMet, uh, freely available. Um, and that's the website, movementecology.net. And it's kind of constantly getting updated as I add more functionality to it. And um, I hope it's going to be a dynamic thing and if people have ideas or if there's things you'd like to see as part of it. So I'm just going to go through um, some preliminaries. So uh, like other packages, I've defined um, a trajectory as a set of time sequential points. Um, typically GPS data um, and at the moment I don't have any functionality for accelerometry data or anything like that so it's just GPS data at the moment. Um, I recommend, recommend using uh, universal coordinated time for um, your, your fixed time information and storage in a ESRI geo database is sort of one of the requirements. So. <laughs> um, and we'll see why. But um, okay, so I'm going to just get into um, showing you. So once you've installed it, so that's sort of the first hurdle in making. So one of the problems, of course, with with writing code for a commercial software package like Esri is that it's constantly updating. You need licenses, and there's a lot of headaches around that. So I apologize, but that's sort of. Um, then again, a lot of people have access to ArcGIS. And this is a sort of a GUI-based system, so it's point and click. So it's, it's going to be easier for people that don't code in R and aren't as comfortable with coding. So um, there have been other incarnations like HOS tools. I know probably a lot of people have used HOS tools. It's sort of um, been discontinued now, and then GME came out, and I'm not sure where that stands at the moment. But um, anyway, I've... I've um, developed my own set of um, software tools. So under the hood, it's a, it's a C-sharp uh, software library um, that I've developed with all these functions. Um, so in theory, it, it doesn't have to run within the ArcMap environment. It can be coded. And I've done that. Uh, for instance, I run these software objects on our server, and they're in a real-time monitoring environment for ele elephant data. So Things like cluster analysis and whatnot are running in continuous real time in a program I have on our, on our server. Um, so that's, that's what it looks like under the hood. But in ArcMap, it, it looks like this. So it's an extension um, that interfaces with movement data that you've added into ArcMap. So here I've got some data sets uh, set up. So for instance, here's a bull elephant. Let me just get rid of this. Um, here's a data set from a bull elephant in Kenya called Kenyatta. Um, so I'll be running some things on that. And I have another data set uh, from another bull elephant called Mungu. And then I've also combined, so probably the preferable way to store data to, for use with ArcMet is in a combined, uh, so a feature class that sits in a, in a geo database. So that can either be a personal geo database or an SDE, like an Oracle um, system. And data gets stored in the same um, feature class, but gets designated by an ID. So you can separate out um, different um, movement data sets based on an ID value. So you can feed that into ArcMet, um, and it'll essentially batch process then and, and separate out each trajectory on its own. Um, so unfortunately, this is, here, get rid of that. Okay. So one of the first things, um, you would typically do with your data is visualize it. So just by bringing it into ArcMap, you, you can do that. Um, one 
thing that I've promoted the use of in ArcMed is temporal and spatial segmentation of your data. Um, so I'll start showing you that. So there's this utilities menu here, and it's got a few things. So I'm first going to create a polygon grid that covers the study area location. Um, so I select the data set, and so there's the move data, data set, and I can set a grid resolution, and I can choose to expand it a given percentage beyond the, uh, the extent of the data set. So if I say, say 1.1 times the envelope size, um, so I can create a, uh, I'll make this a five, or let's go, yeah, 5,000. Um, and all of the output from ArcMet is going to be in file geodatabases as well. Um, so I've created this polygon data set now. Um, so if I drag that down. So filtering, um, so, so I'll just go through these tools. Um, okay, so I've got this filter tool, and you can apply a, like a speed-based filter to the data. Um, so if I apply a movement filter, so I can set, say, a maximum speed. So if I have a point that zoomed off to the middle of the Indian Ocean because that was an error in the fix and it's got a 1,000 kilometer an hour movement speed, um, it'll filter that point out. Um, it'll also enforce a minimum distance separation between points, which is important if you're running something like a Brownian bridge where you need, you know, the, there has to be a movement uh, distance covered there. And also a minimum time separation. So you'll start getting errors if you run some of the movement tools and you have zero time spans or zero distances between points. So that's just a basic filter um, which you can apply to kind of make your data um, work well within the, the environment. Um, you can apply a temporal filter to your data. So if I want to choose just a given time period and segment down to that time period, I can do that. Um, I've got a day-hour filter. So if I want to filter out, it's like the, the sunset and daytime data. Um, so I can define um, if I wanted just daytime data. So if I'm working in Kenya and my data is in GMT, there's a three-hour offset. So I have to know. If the sun gets up at 6, I subtract 3 hours. So anyway, so daytime would be defined between 3 and, and 1,500 hours. And so it'll just take those, those points and leave the rest out. Or I could get nighttime data by doing the opposite. So from 15 to 3, for instance, and that would be nighttime data. Um, so I can apply that filter if I want. Um, and then I can spatially segment the trajectory into different um, regions. So if I wanted to look at trajectory that was inside a national park or outside a national park, I could use that. So I've, and any polygon grid um, or polygon feature class that you add to ArcMap can be used as the filter footprint. So um, here I've got this polygon grid I've created, um, but that could easily be a, a national park, for instance. Um, for the calculation, so here, um, let me choose, sorry, get the input. Um, so here I'd choose the file I want to run it, or the trajectory file. Um, and I can tell it then that there's, um, my data can be separated by that ID field, is what designates the different trajectories. Um, so I'm not going to run this, but it would run and create a single feature class separated with um, the unique IDs for each of the trajectories. And if I apply a spatial filter, it's also, also going to append the ID value for the spatial filter. So you've got essentially segmenting your trajectory into spatial um, regions. And it'll provide a summary table as well um, in the same place that you store the output. So actually, I'll just go ahead and run it. Um, so let's see. Let's set up. Let's set up. Okay. Um, so it's running through the different spatial polygon regions and creating uh, subsets now and storing those in the output file. Um, so that's, that's sort of the first thing that happens in the analyses I've been doing is filtering, getting data set up, cleaning it, um, and prepping it for further analysis. So that's what that tool is all about. Um, so I'll just let that run. Um, so the next 
tool is a, that I've created as a resampling tool. Um, so this is a way to, so some of the analyses I've been working on, okay, so that took there. Um, some of the analyses I've been working on, I've had to downsample data. So I've created two ways of doing that. Um, one is to randomly delete points. So you can say I want, you know, to randomly delete 50% of the points in the trajectory and then run whatever analysis to compare against the higher resolution data or create systematic breaks in the data. So if I wanted, if I have hourly data and I want four hour data, then I can delete sort of the three points after um, and create systematic gaps in the data. So that's been useful on a couple of occasions. Um, this has a, a move win tab, as do a lot of the tools. So I'll just quickly show you the, um, um, so essentially that will allow you to segment temporally. So you can, you can provide moving window dates for all of these tools. So if you want to run that, but just for these times, it'll do, it'll input that dates file. So you can create the dates file using this create move win dates tool. Um, so here, for instance, if I wanted to create a, um, a file that had uh, monthly start and end dates, so just April of 2014, May, et cetera, um, I could do that using this tool. So I can, I can select either using a calendar what the start and end dates of the file should be, um, or I can base it off of an existing movement data set. Um, and then over here, you can select the window unit. So if you want, for instance, um, a one day moving window, you would select day. And then the clamp option allows you to, so say your first point in your trajectory is at 3 a.m. If you choose clamp, it'll automatically clamp to the start of the day, so at, at 12 a.m. and create windows of time like that. And here you specify how big the window is. So if I wanted uh, one day, I would keep that as one. And if I um, wanted to say a 20 day window, I could set that to 20. Um, other options in here are weeks, months, years. So you can do, and I've also added in, um, for instance, the MODIS 16 day windows. So that, that will create a window file that corresponds to the MODIS image dates and also the spot 10-day image dates, which are kind of variable. So um, I've used that in a number of analyses where I've, I wanted to match up, for instance, a, a home range area, but for the exact time that corresponds with a given single modus 16-day image. Um, so that will produce that uh, output file for you. And, that, and you can also randomize. So if I wanted to randomly pick a window of time between the start and end dates of, of the date file, um, I could do that and, and choose the number of iteration, random iterations. Um, so that's been a very kind of useful tool in a number of analyses. Um, and then that feeds into, um, so here I would specify, so you create a CSV output file and it's just a, and you could do it in any program like Excel or whatever and you just, it has a start and an end separated by a comma um, and that's all. And then a, it's a, uh, just a very simple file. Um, and you can specify that as an input, and then the tool will just segment temporally for those dates. So, um, so let's go on. Um, so the next thing is a path tool. So this creates the uh, a joint, like join segments between successive locations, and it computes a number of metrics. Um, so here I'll do um, movement data, and you can apply a a segment filter to that. So if, if for instance, you're, you don't want statistics on anything that wasn't connected by, or say your data has a, a data gap of over 12 hours and you're not interested in any statistics on that, so you could apply a filter and it, then it'll cut out anything over that time. Um, and again, you can apply the moving window um, file to that. And then, um, so I'll run this. Um, so, and you can see it's creating sort of individual databases as output to store the output, and you can, you can name those on the fly. If the database already exists, it'll append output into that database. Um, okay, so here it's added it. Um, 
on top. So I've just created trajectory paths for those so I can turn them on. And if you look at the attribute table, it's calculated a whole bunch of different metrics for each of the segments connecting the points. Um, so start date of the point. Uh, sorry, this is getting cut off. So total time in hours, the start date, end date, midpoint, the distance in meters, speed, heading, the turn angle, um, the net squared displacement of the endpoint of the segment, and the, the displacement in the x and y direction for that segment. So just a bunch of summary statistics that um, can be helpful. I would probably then take that file and export it to R so <laughs> to do graphs and stuff. So this is just a more convenient way, I guess, or if you're more comfortable with ArcMap. I mean, it's nothing that you couldn't do in R. Um, so the next tool in here is a path statistics tool. So this is going to take um, your trajectory and then calculate statistics over the entire length of the trajectory. So um, let me do, uh, and you can select distances to summarize by distances, speeds, or headings at the moment. Um, so again, I can apply a segment filter. So if I wanted to filter out segments that were longer than, say, four hours or six hours from that calculation. Um, so here I, I'll use the, the dates file on this one, um, tell it that the ID is the separator, and then run it. And it'll store in the new geodatabase. So it's taking each of those windows of time, segmenting the trajectory, and then calculating the, stati the statistics, um, which I've chosen to be distances. So if I look at um, that output, um, you'll see that it's done. So the, the total time span for the window is 744 hours. So I've, I've used monthly windows there. So within that month, the sum of the distances traveled by that individual was that amount. The minimum segment distance was that. The max, the mean, the sample variance, standard deviation. Um, if I had applied that segment time filter, you'd get values on the count and uh, um, how, much, um, how many segments were included in the calculation, for instance. So that's a, a convenient way of of calculating metrics, um, path metrics. Um, I also want to point out that in each of these calculations, it'll create a, um, an output table with results. So if there are any error messages, um, so for instance, here I'm getting error messages, but that's because my dates file extends beyond the, the actual trajectory time. So within a given month, um, so between January 1st and, and um, February 1st, 1998, there was no data for that elephant. So that's why I got an error um, thrown. But for where it could, um, it'll provide you with the output um, and any errors that might have happened and so on. So, so And for other tools, as I'll show you, um, things like the Brownian bridge tool, it'll output the, the mobility variance parameter in that results table so that you, you kind of have a log of your calculations and when you ran them. Um, so the next thing is a path metrics tool. So that's um, similar to the statistics, except it's going to calculate things like the displacement along the trajectory, uh, tortuosity, um, and other sort of higher level metrics. Um, so I won't run that. But um, then um, temporal metrics, so that's taking your your time spans, and that's looking at the statistics of the time spans. So if you want to, and I've been working a lot on how do you compare data, say sampled at four hours with the hourly data, um, and is a home range valid if you've sampled it at four hours compared to an hour or 12 hours? And so the temporal metrics of each of the time spans in your trajectory will give you a sense of the quality of the data. Um, so you can look at sort of like the variance and the, the mean of the time span values. Um, so that'll all get spit out with the temporal metrics tool. Um, this velocity grid tool is something we came up with for um, a paper we wrote on the Mali elephant movements. And we wanted a way to kind of summarize, you know, if you look at a map with a whole bunch of animal trajectories on it, 
um, how to make sense of that data and summarize it across the landscape. So we came up with this velocity grid tool, which essentially takes a, it, it creates a grid across the landscape. And for every grid cell, it summarizes um, like the mean speed of the animal in that grid cell, what the average angle of direction was, and something we call the dot product index, which is essentially how aligned the tracks are within that. So if you have a, um, you take the dot product of every track segment, um, sort of the n factorial combinations you can do, and then come up with the mean value for dot product. So if, if tracks are very aligned in one direction, you'll get a high dot product index. Um, if they're cross like this, you'll, so it, it varies between zero and one. So if you had perfectly aligned tracks in that grid cell, you'd get a, a value of one. Um, so when you do that calculation, um, where is that? Here. Um, you get something that looks like this. So here, the velocity grid tool is, is output. So it, it's a, for every grid cell, you'll get a single vector emanating from, the, it's essentially like a wind map, I guess. You get a grid cell, um, a vector coming out of the grid cell, pointing in the mean direction of travel of all the tracks within that grid cell. Um, and the length of the arrow corresponds to the speed, the mean speed of the tracks. And then I've also added the coloring um, to represent the dot product index. So if you have a red value, things were very aligned. If you had a, a yellow value, they were quite scattered. And that's maybe more indicative of foraging. So when we looked at the Mali system, we had a, you know, it instantly comes out of where the kind of travel corridors are. Um, versus the more foraging areas like here. So here's a, a definite corridor as well as here. And then we ran a, a k-means classification. So you get these three raster grids out. And then we used a k-means classification to classify what might be foraging versus travel um, grids. So anyway, that's, that's in our Mali paper from last year. Um, and that's part of ArcMet. Um, so moving on, so those are kind of the trajectory-based tools. Um, then I've also got uh, something, I haven't actually used this in any analysis yet. <laughs> I wrote it, um, but it's just sitting there. Anyway, you can, you can run this con-specific proximity tool. So if you have data sets from multiple animals, um, so here I've got Kenyatta and Mungu who have overlapping data sets. And so you choose animal A and choose animal B. Um, and it'll take animals A to animal A's data. And for every point in animal A's data, it'll try and find a corresponding point in animal B's data. And you can add this time snap, which is essentially a fuzzy window. So it'll sweep across the, that um, number of minutes looking for a corresponding data point. And then if it finds it, it'll calculate the interdistance. Um, and that looks like, so I pre-calculated that. Um, so that's Mungu and Kenyatta's inter-distances. So if you look at the, um, the, the attribute table, um, you'll see sort of the, the values here. So you've got animal A and animal B, where they were, um, what the proximity was in meters, and the absolute bearing of one animal to the other. Um, and I haven't actually analyze that in any <laughs> significant way, but it's, it would be interesting. And certainly after the last talk, that sounds very relevant. So, um, so that's, a, that's the proximity tool. I've got a couple of range tools. So the classic MCP range, um, so you can quickly calculate um, MCP ranges. So if I want to do, let's say, uh, Kenyatta, um, and you can, you can identify the percentile values of the MCP ranges. And again, you can use a moving window input. So if I want just monthly MCP ranges, then I supply the moving window input. Um, so let's do that. And OK, let's see, MCP. <coughs> so when it's saying creating trajectory, it's basically loading that data into memory and then working on it in memory. Um, so, and there's quite a lot of, I think it's 33,000 points, his data set. So, um, and so there's a 
whole bunch of MCP ranges. So I can do a similar thing with um, the loco range. So it's the alpha or the A loco um, home range model. Um, so it does the exact same thing um, that I've just shown you except with a different model. So then I've got these field tools. Um, so representing a trajectory is a spatial field. So the, the classic one, of course, is the kernel density. Um, so you can calculate kernels um, or utilization distribution based off the kernel model. Um, and you can use, I haven't done LC, SV, CV yet, um, but you can use either of these for your smoothing parameter. Um, again, you can add the moving window dates file. Um, here I've added um, a few twists on it. So you can specify, so for a kernel, um, say you have your Gaussian kernel, and you move beyond, say, 10 standard deviations from the mean center, the probability value is so low that it's not really worth going further out from that in your calculation. So if you've got this huge landscape grid, then there's no point in calculating way down, you know, miles and miles and miles away. So it just skips that, and you can specify that cutoff for each kernel um, with this parameter, and that speeds up the calculation quite a bit. Um, you can also specify for grid, given grid cell to set the value to null if it's below a certain value. So rather than just getting a grid with all zeros, um, you can set the null value. Um, so that's, those are two twists. And so the other thing is that the, the calculation runs in parallel. So I've been able to use the, the .NET libraries to parallelize so the more cores you have in your computer, the faster it runs. Um, so I've coded up um, the Brownian bridge tool, for instance. And um, so all those same things apply. Here you can set the, the Brownian bridge parameters. So you can set, um, you can set a, a max, so basically a linear filter. So skip, skip the Brownian bridge for any segments that are longer than, say, 12 hours or 4 hours or whatever you want. Um, if you leave this blank, it'll calculate the animal mobility variance on its own. You can specify your standard error for the telemetry um, and your integration time steps. Those are directly out of um, Horn's 2007 paper. Um, again, the moving window dates file. And you can set up the output raster, um, giving it a grid cell value. So I, this calculation on Kenyatta's data took, um, so I used the moving monthly, so I created monthly Brownian bridges um, for his data set and it took about three and a half minutes um, and that's here. So if I go into, it's created, so these are all the monthly grids. Um, oh, let me turn off the MCP and turn off that. So, um, so you can go in and, and it's created monthly grids, and again, that calculation is parallelized, so it, it runs, I found it was about 10 times faster than the R code when I tested it, but that was on a quite a highly parallelized machine. Um, so that's basically it, I guess. Um, there's a couple other things in here you can quickly create if you want to zoom into a study area. Um, you can create a, it'll just take the extent of your view window and create a, um, a polygon, so if you want to define, you know, it's useful in some cases. Um, and the other thing I've done is if you want to select, um, if you want to temporally select data, like for instance, if I am looking here, I've got this temporal selection tool. Um, so I can select the data set, Kenyatta's data. Um, oh, not MCP, Kenyatta's data, fixed time. And you can create a forward and backward selection window. So if I just click on a point, um, it'll select the 12 hours before and after. So that can be helpful in certain cases. If you're looking at the sea of data and you want to see where the animal went, um, that can be useful. So um, yeah, so anyway, it's free. It's under development. It's not perfect. <laughs> but it's, uh, I'd be happy to get some feedback. and. Uh, and I will be expanding it. I've got a couple other things. I've got um, a grid. Uh, basically, you can put all your raster layers. So say you have temporal NDVI layers. You can put those into a raster catalog in a geodatabase. 
and then take polygon areas like home ranges and it'll, it'll compare against the raster stack and do statistics over that raster, over that area within that raster stack. And I've used that a lot for some of my analyses. So. Anyways. Oh. <laughs> Um, so the question was, uh, how does the maximum number of points affect the calculations and, or the speed? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really how many points you've got it, you know, for, say, the Brownian Bridge model, um, for Kenyatta's data, if I was just to calculate that, I mean, it's going to vary on the grid size I choose, but it would take about five minutes on my desktop computer at home, but I've got two CPUs on that, and, um, so it's, yeah, I, uh, this is 33,000 points in that one data set. Um, so, yeah, I've, I haven't run into a limit yet. I think it's basically how much the array size that your memory can hold. So a, a .NET array and how uh, big that, how long that can get. So, and that varies as a function of your memory. Yeah. Yes. No, so I, I mean, they are .NET classes, and so if there's a way, I don't know how to do that, but if someone does, then I could certainly try and figure out how to make those available through Model Builder, um, which might be yeah, very useful. So right now, I mean, the, it's a class library, and if there's a way to wrap those into Model Builder, um, then that'd be great. Okay. 